apologies for the abrupt cut off everyone. Um, I noticed a second or two after the camera had died, so back we go. Now I've just been saying the odds against the headquarters surviving the attack by those three infantry regiments were horrendous. And so it proved, despite a fairly heroic resistance, a very brief heroic resistance, the um, 11th Indian headquarters went under. And the Japanese 5th Division has effectively cut off the units on Penang Island from escape because the only way they can cross to the mainland easily is to go into the eastern half of Penang, which they cannot do. Uh, and also they've got some immobile coastal artillery there, but it's really not going to help them. So it looks like the defences in that half of Malaya have been rendered completely hors de combat for now. A very, very successful turn indeed for the Japanese. Now a lingering question for them is what to do with this infantry unit here that's been left isolated in the jungle. They could fall on it, but... The question is, do they really need to? Its offensive capabilities are utterly hopeless. If they can work around it and occupy the key points, that, pure un that poor unit will be left struggling to try and get itself back into supply and will not be able to do anything else. They could literally leave it to wither on the vine. So really, that's the sensible thing to do. Don't don't throw lives away needlessly engaging units that you don't have to. They've already scored some victory points for knocking out the two units they already have done. They've got a healthy lead in victory points ensuring that they retain the initiative. So there's no reason to, to really engage in pointless fights. They're going to need all of their strength for when they get to Singapore. So they're going to um, stick with that for now. So that is the end of the first Japanese um, phase. They've had their movement, their bombardment and their combat, and it's all gone pretty much according to plan for them. And they've also, most crucially, cut off a whole load of British units. So now, what do the British do? It's their turn. They can start with their movement and everyone can move. Um... In an out-of-supply state, those units effectively have no offensive capability, so they may as well hold there for now. Chances are the Japanese are going to attempt to take Penang Island because there's a victory point star waiting for them there. And also, once they um, successfully gain control of Penang and its port, they can begin doing amphibious hooks down that side of the coast. So it's well worth them doing because it lays the um, western Malayan coast open to their depredations by sea. Assuming the land advance doesn't get there first, it's doing pretty well. Um, this unit in the jungle... Now the way we've been playing it, because of course in the game rules as written... It's very hard for a unit to be put out of supply at all. So what we've done is say that any unit who's um, or certainly every, any British unit that cannot trace supply to either Kuala Lumpur or latterly Singapore off the map um, or off the edge of the bit of the map that you can see has to manoeuvre to try and get itself back into supply. So the logical thing for these poor straight settlements volunteers is their their movement has been reduced to two. Now, that's exactly how much it's going to cost them to go crashing through the jungle. So they're going to try and make for a friendly supply point, disengage from this huge Japanese force that they're right next to. But as you can see, it's going to take them so long to crawl down the peninsula. They're effectively out of it, really. So they'll struggle away. Now, the Japanese success over here has effectively turned the Commonwealth positions everywhere else. Um, this unit here, the um, 12th Brigade 
has its movement reduced, but it's going to have to try and go round because attacking would be crazy in its weakened state. So they're going to go one, two, three. They're going to enter that Japanese unit zone of control, but they're not going to attack. In fact, they can't attack because they're out of supply, so they're going to have to try and filter through in order to get further south, if the Japanese let them. And of course, the position here is now totally untenable. There is no communication with the south, so the 28th Indian is going to have to pull back as well. And at their reduced movement rate from being out of supply, it's going to be a very long and very dangerous retreat for them too, with the prospect of Japanese pursuit harrying them all the way. This is not very welcome news for them. Um, other than that... There is an awkward question for the British about what to do with these units. Now, they're cut off too, but they're suppressed, so they can't move this turn anyway. More awkwardness. Now, as the Commonwealth player, I would think that Kuala Lumpur is in danger of being cut off and left out on a limb. So, while it's very, very painful a decision, the garrison of Kuala Lumpur is going to fall back, abandon the city effectively, and withdraw its forces. They'll leave a holding force in the city in the form of the air, the air unit there, because they want to keep as many of their airfields going as they can, as long as they can but every other unit is going to fall back to the Gamas Tumpin line because that's their next best option, really. In the meantime, the Australian units further south will move in to hold the Gamas side. Yes, that would do nicely. So there are some reasonably powerful units there that will be able to make a stand. Move the Australian HQ up. Actually, let's place them there. Slightly more defensible terrain. They can make it. The other awkward question in the south is, should the garrison of Mersing be left there? The Commonwealth is going to take a risk and say no. Because putting it in close proximity to this bunch means that the Australians can concentrate their strength around Gamas. And because it's in clear terrain, they can execute, they, sorry, they can implement a zone of control which overlaps the one at Tumpin and actually have a chance of halting the Japanese if the Japanese are silly enough to come through the open area. We'll have to see how desperately pressed they are for time. So that is the end of the Commonwealth movement. Can the Commonwealth launch any attacks? None of their air units are in a fit state, and anyway, they were all committed to um, air superiority missions. It's not looking good wherever you train the camera. The units in Penang are so badly outmatched that they would be better off holding there. That unit is out of supply, so under the rules we've fashioned, they can't attack anyway, even though they're in contact. Might be tempting to, but 
they can't do it, it's simply not an option. And the Commonwealth has no one else in contact with Japanese forces. So that ends their first phase. So we go straight to the Japanese second phase now. And this is where it gets a little trickier because the Japanese have not activated all of their HQs. So that group can stay where they are for now, or actually, as the Allies, uh, as the British are very obviously giving up Kuala Lumpur, the temptation is to push forwards. No, the Japanese will be cautious. Although that's a very weak unit, they are defending a city, which is a bit more defensible in terms of the column shifts than a town. So they, the Japanese will not give in to the temptation to rush forward. They're going to do a bit of consolidating. What they are going to do is feed some of their other units through. So one, two, three, five, six, seven. They're going to they're going to instead bring up an armored column to try and push into Kuala Lumpur. Oh wait, no no they're not. They're not. I lie. Because that headquarters was left unactivated. So no, they aren't actually going to do very much at all. They can bring down some of these other units, but really their most useful ones are up there. So that might have been a bit of a miscalculation on the Japanese part, because there's a lot of handy units here that they can't move this turn. However, the 18th Division headquarters is activated, and they are going to throw a powerful pursuing column down the road after the 28th Indian. So let's see what they do. They're first going to push their good Imperial Guard divisions into Tanamera. And then the pursuit group is going to go after the 28th Indian, closely followed by the other echelon. And with everything in Kotabaru now in pretty good hands, the Imperial Guards HQ is going to try and catch up with them. So the question now becomes, do the Japanese want to chance an assault over there? Might be worth it to knock out that weakened Commonwealth division, sorry, brigade. But again, is it worth doing? That unit is out of supply and unable to attack them. And while there's a lot of units in their column, because of the intensity of the earlier fighting, they are in fairly poor shape to, to take the... Uh, the Indians on in uh, the rough terrain that they're in at the moment. So what it might be better to do, a bit un-Japanese in temperament, but the safer approach might be to simply keep in contact with the retreating Commonwealth unit, keep a sword in their back, metaphorically, and run them to ground eventually, when they'll have to confront the fresh divisions of the 18th, sorry, the fresh um, regiments of the 18th Division. That seems a sensible way to approach this for the Japanese. So they are going to call a halt to their movement there. They've pretty much moved everyone they can. Now, are they going to conduct any bombardments? The answer is no, because they've committed all their aircraft and naval assets in the first round. 
What they will do, because these units are in contact, is that they are, or are they? It's going to be a bit of a tough fight, that one. Maybe not that tough. Yes, they're going to commit their troops to an assault of Penang Island. So it's the same regiments from the 5th Division who are going in, and they are faced by the coastal artillery and the repurposed anti-aircraft guns of the defenders. So 18 on 3, oh dear. 6 to 1 odds. The defenders are in a town, so it's a column shift to the left. The Japanese, probably more for the fun of it than anything else, and also it gives me a chance to demonstrate this, are going to use the Banzai token. Now what this does is the Japanese can receive a column shift in their favour, so it negates the defensive terrain advantage. They ignore any route and retreat results, and eliminated units on both sides end up in the permanently removed pile. So this is a bit of a be-all or end-all. Probably not worth the Japanese playing it in normal circumstances, but the Banzai counter is a pretty cool thing, and I wanted to demonstrate how it worked. So, like many of the Japanese tokens, it doesn't go out of play. It's returned to the pool, and they may well see it again. So let's roll and see how they do. And they get a six. Ouch. That is, uh, that is a nasty result for the Commonwealth. Defender annihilated. Eliminate all defending units and place them in the permanently eliminated pile. Oh, well, that's no good. Banzai or not. <laughs> it was, uh, um, those guys are out of it forever and will never be coming back. Attacking units may pursue one hex. Well, to be perfectly honest, it's not worth every single regiment going in, so the Japanese will just commit one of them. Be more than enough to mop up the airfield defen uh, defense battalion there. And that's another job well done for the Japanese. They've seized another victory location. That's not so good. So back to the Commonwealth for their second round. Now thankfully, unlike the Japanese, they were able to activate more headquarters. The problem is finding um, units that are actually in range of them because everyone's been so badly cut off. Um, and looking around, I'm afraid they have no real options. Neither of those units up there have HQ support, and actually that one, trapped on the southern tip of Penang Island, has nowhere to go. In the centre of the peninsula, those two can't move because there's no headquarters within range. And finally, over here, without compromising the defence of Singapore itself, everyone who can move is pretty much gone where they want to. So not many choices for the Commonwealth. They're just going to forego any movement this turn. And no, there are going to be no attacks because there is nothing they can do with any advantage and their only units that are in contact are either incapable of attacking because of their nature or because of their supply state. So no choices there, unfortunately, for the Commonwealth. They just have to sit out that second round. So that's it for the second movement um, and fighting impulse. We now come to the end of turn phase. And we just have a quick look at who's gained what. So the Japanese secured a new airfield in Gonkada, but they haven't staffed it, so they don't raise the number of... Um, aircraft they have available. They also took successfully um, Penang, which is a victory location. 
So that goes up. So between the infantry losses they've inflicted and seizing Gold Star territory, their victory points now stand at 20. Uh, the Commonwealth, unfortunately, has only given up ground. But it's not over yet, and it's the end of turn two, so the Japanese are a third of the way into the game. It seems like they've made a lot of progress, and they have, but it's worth bearing in mind that Kuala Lumpur fell in the first half of January, so in effect the game is playing out according to timetable. Also, as Commonwealth play, uh, reinforcements come in, and they have a narrower area to defend, the Japanese will begin to find the, the going somewhat harder because all the advantages they had in the wide spaces of the um, peninsula further north will gradually be taken away from them. There is still favourable terrain all the way down, but there does come a point where they have to trade on the subtlety and go for speed instead. Because in terms of the rejigged victory conditions, and this does make the Commonwealth player a lot more competitive, even though they're still a bit of a punching bag, the necessity for the Japanese to take Singapore will drive them. They'll begin to have to take risks as the game progresses, much greater risks than they've had to take up in the north. So... Despite the fact that the battles and the fighting have pretty much been going only one way so far in the game, there's still many options for the Commonwealth player, and they do have time to reconfigure their defences and indeed to strengthen Singapore, so it's not over yet. Also, despite the fact they receive less supply than the Japanese, I do believe they have an advantage in that they have less to spend it on, as their defences become a bit more um, positional, they will not need to burn so much on activating headquarters and they can begin resuscitating some of their knocked about units um, that they are able to bring back online. Also, there's another also, as the, as the distance to Singapore decreases for the Commonwealth, their reinforcements will have less... Um, ground to cover before they reach the front line. Whereas for the Japanese, they'll start having to wait longer for their reinforcements to get to them, whether they come from Thailand or arrive by sea. But that, of course, is all for the future, and I'll, I'll see how this game goes. And if anyone wants to know, I'll let you know how it goes. But in the meantime, I do hope that's been helpful for um, giving you a sense of how a full turn of this six turn game plays. Um, if you are one of those people who've got it and like us have been struggling to play it in a way that's meaningful, I hope the previous video in this series and this video has been of some help in, um, in clearing up some of the difficulties you face with this game. Um, now that we've refashioned it in this way, I enjoy it immensely, and I really hope that uh, those of you out there who uh, would be willing to give these slightly altered rules a try will get as much enjoyment out of it as I have. But in the meantime, with apologies again for the abrupt cutoff in the middle of this video, thank you so much for joining me. Always a pleasure to see you guys. Um, as always, to my regulars, um, Thank you very much for tagging along, and to anyone who might have just visited this channel for the first time, I hope you found this video interesting and useful. Please do check out the other videos if you, if you spot anything that catches your fancy, and I hope I'll see you again. But just to wrap up, and as always, to <clears throat> tell you how much I appreciate the company, thank you all very much for tuning in. Bye!